In this video, we're going to go through a few of the questions and comments from Blender Fast Track Volume 1. So first off, to kind of show off all your guys' work, if you search for hashtag CG Fast Track on Instagram, there's a ton of really nice stuff going on, and I'm super happy with the results. There's a ton of really good work. Next week I'll be doing a critique video, so if you would like to have me critique your stuff, I'll be doing a video for that. So go ahead and post it on Instagram, and just let me know in the comments that you would like to have it critiqued, and I'll add it to the video. So before we start, there, were, there was a lot of questions in the comment. So we're going to kind of isolate these to be just for questions that are related to the Sword and the Stone series and the topics that we've discussed in the tutorial. We're going to go through a couple different videos to answer as many questions as possible. We're going to focus on the most common questions. So let's get started. So first question we have here is by Trance and he's asking what's next. So I'm going to make a video about this specifically in the coming weeks to kind of let you guys know where the CG Fast Track channel's going and where the website's going, and where the company's going. In short, to kind of manage expectations, the Sword in the Stone series was, was a massive project and you should definitely not expect that every single week on YouTube. We're gonna have a lot more content just like the Sword in the Stone series on the website in the fall. And in the coming weeks, I'll kind of break down what, what to expect from the YouTube channel and what to expect from the site and beyond that. Next up, Alex is wondering if he could use the final result on, the, on his portfolio, and yes, absolutely. Um, you can use any tutorial produced by CG Fast Track to be part of your uh, portfolio. When you're applying for jobs or anything like that, you want your work to be as unique as possible. If it looks like everybody else's, it's not gonna stand out very much. So I'd recommend taking the results that we have in the tutorial, and when you start building a demo reel, start to customize it and take it in a slightly different direction. So there's a couple questions about the sword looking kind of flat when you rendered with Eevee at the end of part two. Um, a couple of people asking why isn't there any reflections. Long story short, the end of part two, we don't actually set up the HDRI. We actually don't set it up to render with Eevee. So that is actually done in part two. So if your end result looks something like this where you can't really see the sword very really well, you can just see the, the runes glowing. Um, there's no actual environment for it to reflect. So if you don't actually tell Blender to have an environment to reflect, it actually won't do it. So for part two, be sure to just stick in look dev mode. And then in part three, check out the HDRI chapter, which will show you how to set up HDRI rendering. So there was a bunch of uh, questions in the comments about the rune stencil not showing up. And this was in part because there was a setting in my Blender file that was actually turned on that actually isn't turned on by default. Unfortunately, YouTube doesn't allow content creators to re-upload their, their videos. So when there's like an error like that, it's kind of hard to fix. So you can see like this is the rune stencil right here. So this is the setting that a lot of people were running into. So if you actually jump down to the description, the best way to follow along is by using these screenshots. So just click on, I'm gonna click on chapter 23 stencils. So this is helpful in a number of ways. One, it makes it to where you don't actually have to try to keep up during the video, you know. It can be very stressful to try to keep up. It's very exhausting, it's very taxing. So watch each chapter. When you're ready to follow along, just open one of these up. And I actually, depending on your guys' comments, I up these, we update these with extra notes so that actually they get, they get better over time, which is really awesome. So there's a couple settings in here, just open up the screenshots and they'll walk you right through what you need to do. So there was a couple comments about animation in Blender Fast Track Volume 1. Blender Fast Track Volume 1 was always meant to focus on modeling, shading, and lighting. So if you want to know more about what's being covered, be sure to check out the introduction to the series. And it goes over Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3, and all the details of what it's going to cover. Kept animation out primarily because it's not really a beginner, so as soon as you get into the animation phase it's definitely getting into more intermediate territory and we wanted to simplify it and make it to where anyone could follow along with the tutorial and we didn't want to leave anybody out all good things come to an end i appreciate you guys wanting more and more of the series but with that said at the end of the q a of the next video i'm going to add in a small section about keyframing and animating the cameras and getting the character to move we're just going to touch up on it very very quickly 
So this is an interesting question. The question here is that while you're working in the industry, are you allowed to have your own custom hotkeys? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. There's a ton of flexibility with that. Anybody you know can modify the hotkeys to any software they're using, no problem. And he, he's talking about if he should switch Blender's hotkeys over to Maya's hotkeys. There's kind of two recommendations I would just recommend thinking about whenever you decide which one to do. If you switch over your hotkeys to be the industry compatible, so what he's talking about here is if you go to edit preferences and then go to key map and then switch this from Blender over to industry compatible. If you're using other packages a lot, it can be really kind of a burden to kind of switch in and out of hotkeys. So there is some advantages of that. It's much, much easier for you to get in and out of packages. So if you're a beginner and you're learning, a lot of tutorials are out there are gonna be using the standard Blender hotkeys. So I would recommend sticking with those and as you begin, as you progress after you get more comfortable, um, then you can kind of just do whatever you, whatever you want. If you wanna switch over to industry compatible so that you can jump in and out of software more easier, that's definitely a good thing to do. Um, you might ask, was changing the hotkeys and like we did in part two of the series a good idea? When we changed those, we didn't really change it much from where what the defaults are already. So like G is still to move, R is still to rotate, S is still scale. So you don't have to actually retrain your brain the hockey. You just have to retrain your brain to add an extra step with the hockeys if you want to go back with the, the defaults. So long story short, if you're a beginner, I recommend sticking with the Blender hockeys. Um, if you're more intermediate or if you plan on spending more time in other software, then you know consider changing it. So there's a couple comments about getting different results in the UVs. So whenever you're doing UVs and you're doing these like automatic projections, the UV projections are very dependent on the geometry that they're projecting onto. So some things that might be causing your UVs to look different are one, you might have different topology. So the way you built it might not be exactly. So it's really, really difficult to recreate the exact model that I did just because there's a couple things that are, you have to do by eye, you know, like the insert edge loop tools, the extrusions, that kind of stuff. It's very, very easy to add like multiple edge loops, which can lead to weird UVs. There's a couple different things you can try to fix that. One, you can try just rebuilding that piece. Um, it's a little time consuming, but that'll give you some practice to go on. Um, the other thing that came up in the comments is with UVs is that whenever you create an object, so say if I just go to add mesh, make sure you have this generate UVs button on. So if that isn't on for whatever reason, things like the handle, and the palm L and that kind of stuff, the UVs won't actually be there to start with. So we actually started with the primitive UVs and modified those. So we didn't actually create them from scratch. So that's something to look into as well. By this point, again, as I was chatting about before, you know, you don't expect to be a polygon master. You don't expect to be a UV master. You know, we barely scratched the surface. The point of this was just to get through your first project. So if you feel like you didn't get the same exact result, you know, feel free to kind of like redo that piece. So next question we have, when is volume two? What is volume two about? Where do we share our renders to show you? So volume two is not yet announced. Volume two will be on the website when we launch this fall. It won't be Sword in the Stone series. It'll be a completely different project that you can build from start to finish. And you can show renders off at Instagram, just hashtag it with CG Fast Track. So this question came up a couple different times. The question is, the rigid bodies wouldn't work, the, the the button is actually grayed out. And the reason for this is actually, uh, in the tutorial, I just kind of like selected everything and it just so happened to be okay. But if you actually select your light or your camera last, it won't actually allow you to do that operation. So to kind of show you that is if you select, you know, one cube and go to object, go to rigid body and go to add active, it works fine. But if you select these two and then like select your camera after that, if you go to object rigid body, um, those options will actually be grayed out. So make sure that when you actually select this, you're just selecting your objects like that. So this question is asking what to do if you do the rigid bodies and then everything just explodes. So this typically happens when you have intersecting objects. So be careful that you don't, so be, be careful when you duplicate that you're actually moving them. It's very easy to duplicate and then accidentally just not move them, which means you'll have technically two different cubes stacking on top of each other. So this was another really common question that was in the comments. The question is, 
what do you do if you drop in the color ramp whenever you're shading the sword for the runes? And he's saying, when I change the color of the node, the color of the sword changes instead of the rune, how do I fix that? So I'll break down what this is happening here and I'll actually show you guys a slightly different result. So I'll just add in another color ramp to kind of build this from scratch. And when I plug this in like this, and I plug this into emission. And if I come down here and just change this color, you'll notice that the entire sword starts glowing, which is not at all what you want. So why is this happening? So what's actually happening here is by default, the color that you're selecting is actually the color over here on the left. So the color that you have here on the left, you actually want to keep black. So, so the way this works is black is on the left and then white is on the right. So as you select these two knobs right here, um, so you might have to actually select this and kind of like click and drag to make sure that's selected. But make, whenever you modify this, be sure to actually make sure that this turns white. That's going to let you know that you're modifying the white color of your texture and not the black color. So now when you actually change this, you'll see that that starts to change. So this is a great question by Emma and she, she's asking about the screenshots and what she's asking is, she says it's endlessly frustrating to go through tutorials, pausing and replaying to find the right button to click. Why must all related software be taught through purely video tutorials only? So the short answer is this is just the norm and this is just how people make tutorials. And it's kind of unfortunate and I definitely encourage you guys for those of you guys that went through part one, part two, and part three, definitely go back and take advantage of the screenshots. So it's it's a very innovative thing that we're doing at Fast Track. Anybody learning CG this way is gonna essentially do laps around anybody else learning CG any other way. So you guys are all here very early on, so definitely take advantage of this. And you know, as the CG Fast Track library grows on the website, every single video that we're gonna produce that's meant to be a step-by-step -step tutorial will have this. So essentially you'll be able to get through the learning curve much, much, much faster than any generation of CG artists before then. So there's a couple of questions that are very similar to this. And the question is, why, do my, why does my rune texture look so pixelated? The main reason that I can think of that would cause this is the resolution of the texture. So whenever you create the texture, whenever you create your texture and then you go to new, uh, be sure to up this resolution. So by default, it's 1024. Uh, boost that up to 4096 by 4096 and then when you paint the edges will be much crisper. So this was another really common question. Um, whenever you download the rocks, if they show up pink in the render, essentially what's happening is the blender textures are relative to the file. So what that means is if you download the file, if you move that blender file anywhere else and you don't move the textures with it, Whenever you open that file up, the textures are not gonna be linked up correctly. So if you ever see this, this is the pink uh, rocks that were coming up. Be sure that whenever you download this, you actually open up this file and that textures directory, make sure that they're actually next to each other in your Windows Explorer. And if you move these around, make sure that you move both of them instead of just one of them. So this was less of a question, more of a comment that I wanted to touch up on. The multi-pass compositing, it's definitely, you know, it's getting into more of an intermediate level for sure. It's kind of teetering around beginner. I really wanted to get that in there because I really want you guys to have exposure to that early on. There's not a lot of resources on YouTube for that kind of stuff. But the comment here is that uh, doing it in Photoshop is a lot easier. And when you're first starting out, don't feel obligated to do it all in Blender. If you want to jump into Photoshop and do your compositing work there, definitely do that. And even for the, the contest that's coming up, you know, you don't have to do it all in Blender. You can use other packages as well. So feel free to composite your stuff inside of Photoshop. So this is another comment that I wanted to share with you guys. The comment is about issues with not animating Mixamo characters, bringing them into Blender. Thank you guys for posting solutions like this down in the comments. It helps everybody. So super grateful for all that. The solution that he's posting here is to, if you ever run into an issue with your character not animating, and then just do .dae, he says that was working a bit better. So try that out if you run into those issues. So this is another really, really good question. And what he is asking is, what he's saying is, is he's an advanced Blender user, yet he still tries to make everything scratch, but he can totally see that that's not the way. And he asks, can you tell me what the best way is to decide what to make yourself versus when to use assets? He says, I don't know how I should feel about objects which I didn't create. Should I mention them somewhere in the credits? 
or only mention those that specifically request to be linked somewhere? So this is a great question and it's, it's somewhat of a, a tricky question as well and I'll kind of break it down for you in terms of when I would give credit and when I wouldn't necessarily worry about it. So if any of you guys checked out my reel and you kind of saw the breakdown, you'll notice that when you scroll through here, I am breaking down the software, what I contributed to each shot, what I did, what my participation in each shot was, but I'm not necessarily crediting the entire team or you know each person that did each individual thing or each texture, that, that would end up being way too complicated. And if you're a professional, um, this is kind of the norm. This is kind of what is to be expected. This is just what people do. When people look at your stuff, they're not necessarily concerned about, okay, where did all this come from? They're concerned about, okay, what did you do? On top of that, if you ever watch a movie and you watch the credits, you know, they're not going to credit, you know, textures.com and all these different asset libraries. They're just going to credit the people that worked on the project. So that's completely different. But if you haven't really reached that professional level yet and you're working on your own personal portfolio projects, what I would recommend is that the people that are gonna be viewing your projects, the very first question that most all of them are gonna are gonna ask are is what what did you do you do or how did you do that? So it's a bit different when you're making personal artwork. So I would say good practice on that is if you use different assets, yeah, I would just go ahead and credit them. So you know I got my rocks from Mega Scans or the buildings from Kitbass 3D. I would say, you know, when you get to that texture level, um, you don't have to say, you know, this scratch map came from there, that scratch from, came from there. That's not really, you know, um, that would be really time consuming. In terms of what you should create from scratch and what you shouldn't, my recommendation there would be when you're creating your own artwork, you know, make the hero prop, make the hero asset. So in this case, we bottled out the sword and then we just used the rocks that were provided with the tutorial, tutorial or we could use rocks on mega scans to build out the environment. So th those are secondary assets. So I would say the hero assets, the main assets, you know, I would encourage you to get practice and model those out yourself, but all the secondary stuff don't necessarily be overly concerned with that. With that said, you know, if you're kind of starting to build a demo reel and you're starting to specialize in a specific area, so say if you want to build a lighting demo reel, you don't necessarily need to build any of the geometries from scratch. You can just focus on the lighting and the compositing of it, you know, making the beautiful image rather than actually building the models from scratch itself. So there's another great question. So the question here is, was everything built in my demo reel using just Blender? And definitely not, you know, any project that I work on these days, I'm working on with four or five different software. So there's a big breakdown if you, uh, click on the breakdown in my reel. You know, I go over each individual software. So this one's like my V-Ray Nuke. This one's Houdini, Maya Arnold Nuke. It's very, 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 very rare that everything on any project is ever done with one one package. You know, Blender is really good for modeling, shading, and lighting. But as you progress, definitely start looking into other packages like Substance Painter to help with texturing, Nuke for compositing, and so on and so forth. It's very easy to think you should do everything in Blender and it's best to use each software for its strengths. All right, so I'm gonna leave it there for the questions this week. We got a bunch more that we're gonna get through next week. So in the meantime, continue posting your work on Instagram, use hashtag CGFastTrack and I will see you next week.